This video introduces the key audio concepts of frequency and the spectrum. And in order to get into this topic, we're going to talk about a particular type of shape of wave that is really key in lots of different kinds of audio work and in lots of different kinds of talking about audio. And that shape is the sine wave. And we see over here on the left uh, a typical diagram of a sine wave. Um, actually, we see one and a half sine waves here. The sine wave is a shape that starts from a neutral or rest position and in a smooth curve goes to up to some maximum and then back down through the rest position and then in a similar smooth curve goes to the, to the anti-maximum or minimum and then in a smooth curve comes back up to that rest position here. So this shape from here through here is one cycle of a sine wave. We've got kind of an extra half cycle shown over here on the image. So the sine wave uh, is important because it is closely related to mechanical motion in the everyday mechanical world of the planet Earth. Um, for example, if we take a, a pendulum, like this Foucault's pendulum over here, and we let it f rock back and forth, like we, we pull it back and then let it go, and if we were to make a graph of the, the left or right, the x position of that pendulum over time, it would look um, kind of like this sine wave, except that as time went by, successive peaks of the sine wave would get smaller. And so that's just one of many ways of demonstrating that sine wave type motion is something that happens in the everyday mechanical world of objects moving around. And sounds, are um, are basically also like this pendulum. They are things that vibrate. You know, some energy goes into a system, it vibrates for a while, it vibrates back and forth, and eventually all the energy is gone. And so it shouldn't be too surprising that we will be able to find this shape in various ways in the complex sounds that, um, that the much more complex sounds that we deal with in our work. So we have a unit of measurement for describing repetitions of these sine waves, a unit of measurement for describing how rapidly that shape repeats itself. And it's the unit hertz, which means cycles per second. But we will most often say hertz. For example, if we say that something is at one hertz, what we mean is that it repeats once per second. So if we go back for a second to this sine wave, if it takes one second for us to get from the beginning to this point here, we could say that this is a one hertz sine wave. If it takes two hertz, if it's at two hertz, then the same shape repeats twice as fast. If we go back to our diagram here again, a two hertz sine wave, if you follow my mouse, might look something like this. Repeating the same shape, but twice as fast. We'll oft also often use the unit kilohertz, um, abbreviated KHZ, which means a thousand. One kilohertz is a thousand kilohertz. So a three kilohertz sine wave would be a sine wave that repeats that shape three thousand times per second. So if we combine this with what we learned in another module, where we described signals, audio signals, in terms of how high they were, their peak, their amplitude. Um, in using decibels, if we combine that with hertz, now we have a way of describing and measuring shapes like these sine waves in terms of two independent dimensions. One dimension is frequency, how fast the shape repeats, and the other dimension is amplitude, how, how big or how high um, that waveform is, how close it is to the maximum. So why is this important? Well, lots of reasons, but um, let's start with this one. Um, we know that we perceive pitch. For example, when someone sings a tone, ah, uh, and we sing the same tone back, obviously with our perhaps a different um, quality of voice, um, the pitch is the thing that we are matching in the other person's performance. That's the thing that we're hearing and that we're able to match. Um, 
so pitch is something that we perceive and that also that we can able able to perform while frequency how fast how how close those waveforms are together how fast those shapes repeat is something that we measure and there's a relationship between these two things um, but it's a complicated relationship so let's demonstrate that um, for a second this is the kind of demonstration that it's um, probably better to do uh, in person I don't know how well it's going to uh, survive this video recording um, but we can at least um, show a taste of it and then perhaps do another demo um, together in person so I have a very simple patch or diagram here in the Max media programming environment and the reason why I'm using this environment for this demonstration is because it lets me show you um, what's going on behind the scenes, what, what the parts are in this little demonstration. Here I have an object that generates sine waves and I've connected it to an object that displays signals as they change and I've got an object here that'll let me make um, signals bigger or smaller, a gain object, and I've connected it to the audio output. And right now, our sine wave oscillator is giving us one hertz sine waves. So if we watch the visualization here, we can probably kind of tell that this signal is going up and down one times per second. It's at one hertz. And if I change this to two, we can see that now it's going up and down two times per second. If I change it to three, now it's going up and down three times per second. And I'm going to um, turn up the gain here. And we see over here that something is coming out of the program's audio output, but we still don't hear anything at this low, very low frequency of three times per second. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to slowly sweep this up and now we start to clearly hear something and as I continue to raise the pit, raise the frequency we're also having the sensation of a rising pitch and we're also having the sensation of it getting louder, even though we're not changing the amplitude of these waves at all. I'm going to turn the level down a little bit. So now it's quieter again, and I'm going to keep moving the frequency up. We're still getting the sensation of the pitch rising. I think it's getting louder again, even though I'm not changing the size of the waveform, I'm not changing the amplitude. It's pretty loud again. I'm going to turn it down. Now I feel like I'm at the same loudness I was a few minutes ago. And I'm going to keep going up. I'm just about to cross the 3 kilohertz boundary. I have this piercing sound. It's getting a bit louder. I'm going to turn it down a little bit. The visualization isn't working very well anymore because of how fast this waveform is going up and down. So we don't need to pay so much attention to the visualization. And as I get up here into the 6 kilohertz zone, I still have a vague sensation of rising pitch, but it's much harder to sing this pitch or to sing a pitch like it. And at some point here, we're going to stop hearing this high frequency. We're kind of in the 10 kilohertz zone. And right now I can't hear it in here in, in my office. I'm not sure if, um, if the microphone here can hear it or not. These things are, get hard to tell. I could, I could make myself hear it by increasing the level here again. Um, but I'm not going to because I want to be a little bit careful um, with my hearing and, and as we'll see in another module high frequencies can be particularly dangerous um, if you're exposed to them in a sustained way um, and at higher higher levels so I'm going to turn the volume off but I do want to review kind of the main points of what we saw in that demo there when the frequency was very low we didn't really hear anything 
And then we started to hear a low pitch and we heard um, rising pitch as frequency went up and it got louder uh, until we got to somewhere in the two and a half to three and a half kilohertz zone. And then as we continued to raise the frequency, it got softer again and we stopped having as distinct an impression of pitch. So we saw that in the middle there was a clear relationship between pitch and frequency, but then on the edges, the very low frequencies and the very high frequencies, that relationship broke down. Um, and there was also a relationship of the frequency to how loud we perceived the sound as being. So common figures for the frequency range of human hearing, uh, you'll commonly hear 20 hertz or 20 times per second cited as a rough figure for the lower limit. Uh, it is possible to hear things below 20 hertz, particularly under the right circumstances with the right loudspeakers. And also those very low frequency signals might become audible in various other ways, including sometimes through our bones. Um, 20 kilohertz or 20,000 times per second is a common rough figure for the upper limit of human hearing in terms of frequency. And here the thing we should note is that differences between humans, um, sometimes related to hearing loss, but not always, mean that in practice the upper limit is going to be somewhat or much lower than 20 kilohertz. But be that as it may, audio technologies are typically designed around the optimistic assumption that we can hear things that move as fast as 20 kilohertz and things that move as slow as 20 times per second. So this next slide is really about um, that thing we noticed in the demo a second ago where the loudness of the signal was changing. Some researchers um, in the 1930s, um, Fletcher and Munson, were the first people uh, to study this systematically. Um, and what we see on this chart is their research from the 1930s. That's the, the blue curves. Uh, and we also see um, more updated versions, more updated uh, analysis of the same phenomena from a 2003 standards thing. Uh, and that's the, the, the red curves here. But what this graph shows is the result of psychoacoustic measurements where people were exposed to um, sounds at particular frequencies and asked to rate them for how loud they were in various ways. And on the basis of those types of experiments, they're able to draw these graphs of the equal loudness curves. And basically what the graphs show is how much energy, how much level, how much amplitude you need to give the same impression of loudness at different frequencies. And so um, here's frequency along the bottom of the graph. And what we kind of see is that in the very low frequencies, like here in the 10 to 100 range, you need a lot of energy, a lot of sound pressure level to give a certain impression of loudness. And then if we follow one of those lines across into the, you say, let's say, let's say the 1,000 to 3,000 range, that's where we see that we need the least energy to give the same impression of loudness. And then after that point, as we get into the high frequencies, getting into four, five, then, then 10 kilohertz and above, the amount of energy we need goes up again. So that's what we heard, right? That very low frequencies were not very audible. They would have been if we put more energy into them. Very high frequencies were not necessarily very audible. They would have been if we put more energy into them. But in the middle, in that zone between, say, 2,500 and 3,500, um, the sound seemed to be quite loud. We found ourselves turning the level down to compensate as we got into this area. So that's the equal loudness curves. And what they really show is that there is a really complicated relationship between loudness and frequency uh, and levels. And I think that there are lots of um, consequences, lots of implications we might draw from this, but I think one of them is just to reiterate that when doing audio work, looking at the visual appearance of a signal, how big it is, doesn't really tell us that much about what it sounds like. And this is one of the reasons why. Another reason why looking at the signal doesn't really, looking at the sort of raw shape of the signal doesn't really tell us that much about what something sounds like, is that typically real world sounds are sums of lots of different frequencies. And the spectrogram, this is a spectrogram right here, is an analytical tool that lets us take that apart. The spectrogram 
uh, is an analysis that you can do to an audio signal. And what it does is it breaks the audio signal down into lots of different frequencies and shows how much power each of those frequencies has over time. And um, so this particular spectrogram, um, it's the frequency is um, the y-axis. And here on the left side of the graph, we can kind of see that it says 93 hertz at the bottom. And the numbers go up. Here is 20, hertz, 20 kilohertz, the approximate limit of human hearing here. And then actually the numbers keep going up all the way to about um, 46,500, so well above the range of human human hearing. And then time is left to right, as in so many of our, our, our interfaces. And then the color within that shows us how much power there is. And the areas that have the most power are the areas that are marked as red, such as these little areas down here. And the areas that have a kind of intermediate level of energy or power are the green, the green ones. So this particular sound, we can see that it has um, a lot of energy sort of spread over the whole spectrum. A lot of different frequencies are present. Uh, and then we can see some particular areas, particular moments in time, and particular moments, particular um, ranges within the range of possible frequencies where there is some more energy, like here and here and here and here and here. So this lets us define um, the spectrum then. The audible spectrum, which is something we're going to come back to again and again, is really the space of frequencies that we can hear and also modify. Um, and if this is important um, for a number of reasons. Probably the most important is that our ability to separate and follow different sounds, sometimes called streaming and segregation, is really closely related to it. We've also seen that we're sensitive to things like loudness, pitch, brightness versus darkness, and these are also closely related to the way things are distributed in the spectrum. So thinking about and working with the spectrum is going to be commonly a central part of audio work. So in summary for this module, we saw that sine waves are important because they're closely related to regular motion in our environment, and sound is one form of regular motion in the environment. We saw that there's a unit for describing how fast sine waves repeat, and uh, in other words, the frequency of sine waves, and that unit is the unit hertz. We saw that pitch and loudness are related to frequency uh, and amplitude, but in complicated ways. We looked at the equal loudness curves. And we concluded by noting that sound work is invariably work in a space of lots of different frequencies mixed together, the spectrum.